Hey, Jenny, can you believe it? We've recorded over 10 episodes of the Wallflowers of Blue podcast. And it was all possible thanks to Anchor. Let us explain. With Anchor, there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And you know what else? Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Which is awesome because it's the first time that we created a podcast. We also upload to CastBox and Stitcher, but there is more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenerships, which is awesome. Yes, it is. We found that out. It's everything you need to start your podcast in one place. Kind of like those big chain stores that have groceries, hardware, and more. Exactly. It is awesome, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. We did. Hello and welcome to Wallflowers in Bloom. A podcast where we share the joys and challenges of being introverts. I'm Jenny. And I'm Eric. Each episode we share with you stories and antidotes that touch on how we prosper and thrive in a world dominated by extroverts. We also have guest speakers who share their experience and expertise on this topic and read letters from our fellow Wallflower listeners on how they cope and conquer. So grab your favorite beverage, settle in, and relax with us. Music is by Nate Johnson. All right. Hello and welcome to Wallflowers in Bloom. Welcome, Martin and Jenny. Martin is our guest, Martin Cox, photographer. Welcome, Martin. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for coming on and talking about yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. We like to start off our interviews with a little mental health check-in. So, Jenny, would you like to start off just to give Martin a little taste of how it's done? For me, it's been pretty good. And I've been doing a lot more walks. I mean, we're still kind of stuck inside because my daughter is doing homeschooling. But we found a nice routine. And it's been getting better. We did the beach last week with a friend almost every day after school, which was nice before it got gloomy. I know I mentioned a few times I've been kind of battling with depression because of all of this. Still battling, but slowly getting better. Well, that's good to hear. How was your week, Martin? Actually, it was good, thank you. I'm enjoying the gloom. I mean, we've had such an inferno of a summer, and with the fires and the bad air, and plus being stuck inside, it seems like the air's improved, and then finally there's some evidence that we're moving into autumn. I'm a fan of the warm weather, but I like to have some variance. Now, with the gloom, is it does that mean there's been rain? It seems like the weather has remembered the idea of rain. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's remembered it's supposed but, to be fall. <laughs> like it could happen, but it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's not happening. There's no forecast of any rain yet. Yeah, well, of course, here in southern England, there's been a bit of rain. But for me, Percy, I love it because coming from living in Los Angeles for many years, it's kind of like being on a different planet. It's also nice to see leaves changing colors. But uh, my week has been good. I started reading The Artist Way that came out, I think, in the early 90s. I get why it's such a popular book. I like that the author shares a little Mm -hmm. bit about her personal story, which really pulled me into it. Once we get into the interview with you, Martin, you know, I'm an artist. And it's weird saying that because although I was that in my head, I worked a corporate life for many years. And so I'm still kind of I'm threading that perception of myself and realizing that I do have choices and I can take breaks and I don't have to work until my fingers are bleeding. So I guess now we can get into the interview. Before we begin, just for the interest of our audience, do you identify as an introvert or as an extrovert? Well, it's an interesting question because I think it's one thing that really intrigued me about your podcast because it's not really something I ever think about. So I didn't really have a strong idea. I dipped into the internet. I can't really call it research. I just sort of looked up a few random things, but I found a few interesting facts. So I guess the concept is sort of attributed to Carl Jung and is not very old. I think the first recorded use of the word extrovert was in 1918, which is not all that long ago. Yeah, I found another reference saying the first use of the word introvert or introversion was in 1699. Anyway, but thinking about it personally, I can see that it's definitely a scale and it's one that I've slid along in multiple directions. Mm -hmm. I was mistaken in thinking perhaps introversion has to do with shyness. Actually, that's really to do with stress. I was a shy young person 
but I grew into an absolute bona fide 110% extrovert, especially when I read about the idea of recharging with other people and not needing any downtime. Oh my goodness, that was absolutely me. If I saw a blip in the timetable ahead where there weren't going to be people around me, I would panic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I had to go from one hilarious social encounter to another and without a break, did not need downtime. That sort of took me through my 20s. And then I think in my 30s, it sort of began to shift and I didn't really quite need to be so external or rather I needed to be more internal. Now I'm 60 which I find very surprising. I don't know, somehow that crept up. Now I would say, you know, I'm definitely sliding towards introversion. But it's introversion, but still engagement with other people. I like to set up encounters that encourage people to come together, but I don't need to be the center of them. I can organize things and then sort of step back, particularly around creativity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was something I would never have been able to do. I couldn't stop and listen or observe anyone else because I was so busy blotting out the sun with my own opinions. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's really come, I guess, perhaps slightly later in life, but as a time of, of my own maturing. Oh, I had a question for you. Do extroverts meditate? Oh, that's an question. interesting one. <laughs> I mean, it sounded like they wouldn't need to. I'm sure they do. Yeah. There's some that do, and I'm sure there's some that don't. I think it'd be a personal preference. I did find a description of something that I'd never heard of. It was on Wikipedia on this topic, and it said, ambivert. Oh, mm. yes, you heard we have. So when I read this, I thought this sounded right. So it said, ambivert is a person whose behavior changes according to the situation they are in. In the face of authority or in the presence of strangers, the person may be introverted. However, in the presence of family or close friends, the person may be highly energetic or extroverted. You know, I've heard that word, that term, and I never looked it up. I feel like I'm more of an ambivert, maybe, possibly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think someone brought it yeah. up on a previous episode. I've known that term as just being kind of in the middle, but I didn't realize the specifics of being with new people. But also introverts are known that once you get to know them, they can talk your ear off. <laughs> <laughs> That's something yes. I can do. You mentioned that you shifted. You were really quiet, I guess, at one point, and then you shifted. Can you remember what brought about that change? You know, I'm not absolutely sure. I don't really remember there being a particular incident or exactly when it happened, but I remember I was painfully shy and awkward. I grew up in Southampton, and the idea of like going into town, I would be all caught up with the interaction that I was going to have to have with buying the ticket on the bus and I'd be sort of clutching the exact change and rubbing it together and sort of until I handed it over and then I could relax for a while because I wouldn't have to speak to anyone until I got into town. And, you know, I don't really know what that was all about, but I was really quite nervous. But I remember that I didn't like the idea that I was shy. So I also adopted some probably more extrovert behaviors in order to cover up my shyness. Like I learned to walk on stilts. I would walk, <laughs> so it's completely mad. So I would walk on stilts with this enormous cloak that would hover over the top of the stilts and would go all the way down to the ground. So I'd be about eight feet tall and I would go walking at night in this forest <laughs> <laughs> and scare the bejesus out of people. Um, and I was afraid of the forest at night. I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of encounters. I was afraid of other people. So I had to be the frightener in order oh. to, to sort of challenge my own fear. So, anyway, it's quite bonkers. But it's not exactly a forest, but in the middle of Southampton, there's a great big sort of natural park where like if a tree falls, it's left fallen. It's called The Common. And uh, we lived right opposite it. So on one side of the street, it was like, comfortable suburbia and on the other side of the street it was just wildland of big old oak trees and there's a lot of dog walkers and joggers and people doing nefarious things but they were all uniformly terrified when the, the still <laughs> <would appear. laughs> bigfoot you said still at first i thought oh this is going to be like this great metaphor and i was like oh no literally he was on stilts <laughs> yeah oh, yeah man. by now i guess everyone could hear your accent that you're um, english Indeed. I said I was in England, but you're actually in America and I'm in England. So <laughs> Yes, we sort, of, we sort of swap places. Yes, I grew up not far from where you are. So growing up in Southampton, which was actually very nice and comfortable and well-organized home, I was very grateful for all of that, had a good start. And having that access to the natural world through that big common that I mentioned, I think was very informative through climbing trees and seeing the cycle of the acorns growing and 
nature is a fantastic teacher. Not being a manicured park meant you could romp around and you could make dens out of branches. You could make giant piles of leaves. We could climb trees. We could make dams. You could find newts in the ponds. It was a sort of um, unscheduled, parentless existence of being able to explore the natural world. And I think that that was very impactful to me as a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place to grow up. But oddly, I did have a sensation, and I remember this after I was in school for a while, I thought, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant or where, but I just felt like everybody else was in a club, and I sort of wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> and I needed to go somewhere. It took a while to figure that out, but you know, eventually I did sort of quite suddenly leave the UK for the States without any kind of a plan other than the fact that I just wanted to be somewhere else. So I left all my friends and family and um, showed up in New York with about $500 and not much of a plan. <laughs> I remember my father sitting me down and saying, should you have a job or something? Or, I mean, what are you going to do? And I, and I just gave him that, you know, like, dad, <laughs> look, like, so it was so conventional. And so I didn't really have a plan, but I ended up living in San Francisco and it couldn't have been more fantastic. So I was in my early to mid 20s. I was always intrigued by you, Eric, when I heard about your sort of breaking away from your life in Los Angeles to engage with Sweden. You know, it always intrigues me to hear other people's stories about making this big transition. And it's my assumption here, but I would think that the older you are, the more difficult it is, because I think you've built up more ties. I always think that if I had left it a year or two, I may never have done what I did. And indeed, I lived in San Francisco. And then moving to LA was like this huge deal, like took forever to decide. You know? yeah. And I was in my 30s when I did that. And I think, gosh, if I'd stayed in England in my 30s, I'm not sure if I'd ever have made mm. it. When you talked about coming to New York, that's how I came to LA from Arizona. I was in college studying theater and then decided I don't hear about actors graduating college. So I dropped out without telling my family and drove to LA with, I think, $800 mm. and no plan. <laughs> so, um, but are. yeah, coming to Sweden <laughs> took four years because I first came in yeah. 2015. And like you said, being older, I was more aware of what could happen as far as the negative things. And so I didn't want to do it without some sort of a plan. My memories of youth is that I was, I don't know, fearless is a word. I was just more like, it never crossed my mind. <laughs> And then my question was, is when you got into photography, was that when you once you came out here or was that back in England? So what happened is I was always fascinated by creativity and art. And I hadn't yet let myself think that photography was actually sort of a bona fide art activity, it was sort of an ancillary activity. So I thought I had to be doing painting and drawings. And I applied to art school actually in Winchester to do a foundation year. And the first thing that they did in art school was to direct us into media that we had not intended to be in. So all of a sudden you're in ceramics and you're doing installation work and you're in the dark room. And I had that experience. It's like the person who ended up being most important to me at my art school with none of my lecturers or professors, it was the dark room tech. Probably an artist himself was now working, you know, as a darkroom tech in an arts college, which gave him access to do his own work. Sadly, I cannot remember his name, and I wish I could because it was so impactful on my life. He taught me how to develop film in a, a traditional darkroom and to print photographs. And I was just absolutely fascinated and gripped with the process. So one day we developed the film, and then the next day we were going to do printing. And I went in in the morning. And he showed me how to work all the equipment. You know, it had that glow of the red light. I was on my own in there. I was making images and I was thinking, okay, I should probably go out for lunch now. <laughs> and I packed up and I opened the door to the dark room. It was nighttime. I couldn't grasp it. I was like looking at the sky like, what's happened? <laughs> what's happened to the sun? <laughs> you know? I had been in there from nine o'clock in the morning. It was now 11 p.m. And I had no awareness of the passage of time and was completely absorbed. I just knew from that minute on that photography was what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just absolutely captivated, you know, by the, these two very different parts of photography. There's one to do with the, you know, the idea, the concept being out in the world, responding to things you see, looking at lights, looking at people, looking at faces, and then this completely separate activity where you cut yourself off from the world and work um, incredible detail with the 
uh, alchemical way with the uh, chemistry and come up with these prints. So uh, pretty much my painting and drawing dropped away. <laughs> At that time in Britain, you would do a foundation year first, and then you would apply to your degree course, mm -hmm. which would be three years. So your portfolio from your foundation year would be your application or a large part of it. And I applied to Exeter College of Art and Design in Devon because I thought they had a really interesting prospectus. And actually, I ended up not in their photography department, but in something called four-dimensional studies, which included photography. So it was anything time-based media. So it could be film, video, photography, series, anything with kind of narrative or time involved in it. And I felt like that best suited. And it was one of those courses that was highly touted in their materials because it was so sort of out there and rare. It meant three years of absolute experimentation, mm -hmm. storytelling, narratives, links between images. These are things that have always continued to show up in my work since then. And you said storytelling. I guess photography is like telling a story. Yes. Well, you know, like once you put is, more yeah. than one image together, you've immediately got kind of a story going on between one image and another. Just to get clarification on my side, are you independent photographer? Are you a kind of a news photographer? What is the type of photography that you do as your career? Landscape photography is my love. And that's what brought me to the States. I had applied to a gallery in San Francisco to have an exhibition and I got that show. And so I left London, came to San Francisco, had the show. I was supposed to fly onto Mexico City, visit my sister and then go back to London. And then I ended up just staying the whole length of my time in San Francisco because I met a lot of other artists and it actually had a kind of atmosphere a bit like art school again. It was very inclusive. It was very easy to get venues. There was a lot of people to work with. There were collaborative projects. It was a very rewarding and experimental time. And for work, mm -hmm. I gradually realized that skill that I'd learned at art school, being able to develop film and being able to print photographs was actually very helpful for me to make money wherever I was. So, for example, when I came to Los Angeles, I ended up working full-time as a printer in a really great darkroom that had some stupendous, famous photographers. Sometimes I had printed some of those pictures. It was a great education because you get to see the proof sheet, you get to see the ones that they didn't pick, you got to see their lighting choices, you got to see their experiments. Either I worked in arts administration, like I would do something in a gallery, or I would work in a photo lab. And then I would always wonder about taking my own landscape pictures and trying to have exhibitions. So I had my own art activity, which didn't necessarily provide income, but it was probably the most important of the three things to me. Eventually, I thought, if I work in this darkroom too long, I'm just never going to see anything. I'm just going to be in the dark all the time. So I thought, I'm going to have a go at being a commercial photographer. I had picked up a lot of experience, but I didn't quite know what I knew. So I needed to know a little bit more about what clients might expect. So I did this sort of masterclass for about six months, and then I transitioned into freelance work. And that could be almost anything. That was sort of my bread and butter for a long time. But then when I wasn't doing it, I'd be out there in the wild <laughs> sticking pictures of strange landscapes. That was kind of my favorite thing. And mm -hmm. continuing to hold exhibitions of my work with the idea that I would move more in that direction. In the last couple of years, my work has really shifted. The advent of the iPhone, the ubiquitous nature of photography, um, a lot of sort of mid-range photography projects vanished. Mm -hmm. And also a lot more people entered you know, realm of freelance photography. So it meant that also day rates started to drop. I'm frankly happy for it because I've been able to spend more time on my fine art. It's one that's for me far more rewarding at this time. Mm -hmm. So since COVID, I have been at home and it's also given me the time to go through a lot of my work and make new projects. You were talking about the dark room. I have my cousin, Emily, she's a photographer, but she graduated with a retouching degree. So did you transition to the digital retouching i'm assuming the black room is now a very old fashioned i guess way yes. of doing things around 2004 i suddenly had clients saying can you send us the files by the end of the day and i just finished shooting them on film and i'd be like ooh, yeah i'd shoot on film because i was experienced with film i was used to film i didn't have a digital camera mm -hmm. and then i would have the film scan onto a cd uh. and then send them digital images. Things started accelerating really quickly. People would say, oh, our you know, PR department needs them in New York the same afternoon that you shoot them. And it's like, oh, good Lord, this is getting really too difficult yeah. to wow. manage. So I was forced sort of against my will somewhat to invest in a whole bunch more equipment. But I did make the transition thoroughly. 
but I still kept shooting black and white film for my own fine art work. So there was a very clear distinction for a while. But then I started using my digital camera in my fine art work and found ways to make that work for me too. The project I'm working at the moment actually was all shot on film. So I'm now scanning that in a dedicated film scanner and making digital prints from that. So as a photographer who was trained, I know a lot of people probably get paid to be photographers, but you still have to have an eye for it. You still have to know composition. You still have to understand colors and all that. Have you noticed a difference in publications or can you spot something or someone who is calling themselves a photographer, but they don't really have all of the things needed to really create? You know, what I have noticed is that particularly larger companies, they have access to people who can do a lot of post-production work it's easy for them to put a lot of money into post-production and they're somewhat unwilling to pay the photographer initially to get a good shot. So I did notice a decline in the skill in, for example, advertising posters. But, uh, you know, on the whole, I think things have really balanced out now. And, you know, there's, there's a lot better work out there. But less work oh, for good. people in the middle, more high-end work. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Really <laughs> sick, I think that's why my cousin ended up getting into retouching and she does actually a wedding work. I feel like that's also very popular is the the wedding photography. You're absolutely right. The wedding photography business has exploded. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that as a younger person that you were more on the quiet side. How did that affect as far as you relating to others? Yeah, I was a quiet child, but I did look to make close friends. You know, I was always looking to find people that I felt like I could trust and communicate with well. And so I had a few really good friends rather than a kind of a big running crowd. And interestingly, I'm still in touch with a lot of those people. Oh, that's awesome. I've known some people since I was five and we're still in touch. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like I have quite a few friends that I then made a little bit later, like probably early teens. And I still consider them, you know, among my closest friends. And we might go months and months and months without being in touch. And when we do meet up, mostly they're still in Britain. It's as if no time has gone by at all. What is Iceland? What happened in Iceland? It really has become the sort of new chapter of my life. So in hot August in LA, uh, with no air conditioning, it was one of those, you know, 90 degree nights and I couldn't sleep. I felt like it was a bit of a crossroads on my work. I wasn't quite sure what to pursue in photography or what show to try and get or just, you know, I just didn't really know what to do. And I had heard some friends of mine had all been going on art residencies. I had never even applied for one for no particular reason. I just didn't think of it. So I was drifting across the internet and I just came across this art residency in Iceland. At that moment, I thought that would be you know, literally a cool place to go. <laughs> like It seemed very attractive, like somewhere cool. And I was very hot <laughs> where I was. And then I noticed that it said that the application deadline was like the next day or something. So I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll just put it in my diary and apply next year or something. And then I just said the second thought, which was like, well, you could just stay up all night and <laughs> do it now. It's not as though... You have to make something up. I mean, you've been working at this for years. I just needed to kind of put a selection of my work together, sort of come up with a theory about what I might do in this location, which I didn't really know. But, you know, I could certainly explore some ideas. And I packaged it all up and I sent it off and I went to bed. And I must say, I kind of forgot about it. And in a few months later, I got a letter from them saying, your application has been successful. We look forward to your residency. Please be in northeast Iceland in February 2nd or something. I can't remember. (laughs) I was shocked and I thought, oh my God, what have I done? You know, I hate the cold. I hate the cold. That's why, that's why I moved to California. I thought Britain was too cold. In February, I, I remember I checked the box for spring. Mm-hmm. It said, do you want winter, spring or summer residency? And I thought, well, spring sounds sort of reasonable. And I thought, there's no way that's spring because I know April in England can be pretty miserable. I started asking questions like, oh, I don't know. It didn't seem like that spring. Their answer was, there is no spring. Anyway, I just thought, okay, if I ask too many questions and I start pulling this around, it's all going to fall apart. I just thought it was sort of meant to be in some way. So I just felt like, go and find out how you dress and go. So I went to REI and bought like everything (laughs) and showed up with like my giant snow boots and my six layers. I flew to Reykjavik. I stayed in a hotel. I then took a tiny plane. It was like the size of my apartment up to this airport in the middle of nowhere and then got a bus and eventually showed up in this tiny town not far from the Arctic Circle. It just seemed like the most fabulous adventure and then met these other people who I was going to be on this month-long residency with. We were really, really got on well. 
and we're incredibly enthusiastic and interested about our own projects and other people's projects. It was just the most fabulous adventure. And that's when I realized that the value of residency, pulling you out of your daily life for that period, your job is just, what is my creative interest today? What am I going to do? What am I going to make? And I thought that was so valuable. And I suddenly understood why people had been going on residencies and why they existed. And I couldn't believe that I had just not ever apply for such a thing. This was in 2016. So then this sort of really strange thing happened though. I met this girl watching. You cut out a little bit. Can you repeat that? Because I feel like that was really oh, important. No, it was, I think it was the starting, connection. Starting from? You said you met I a, met, a whale uh, and then they cut out. I met a captain of a whale watching vessel. Ah, okay. And it's a town that's very popular. Whale watching in the summer is the big activity. <sighs> and in, in February, there aren't any whales. And so he invited me and others from the house to come and drive with him on various adventures. So suddenly I had access to much more of the interior landscape of the country. And also being a local, he knew some great places. And then he invited some of us to come to visit friends of his in the West Fjords, which was about five hours drive, and visit this mussel farm. During this trip, there's a long, long fjord with a house that belonged to the farmer that was not used. He bought the land when it came for sale because he needed the land for his sheep, but he didn't need the farmhouse. So this farmhouse just sits there in the middle of nowhere. No one had been up the fjord all winter, and he wanted to go and see how it had survived. And we spent maybe 20 minutes in the house, and I just had this sensation in that house. I just thought, I can't believe there's this fantastic, quaint house in the middle of nowhere. Artists need to be able to come here. Like, this should be an art residency. Mm -hmm. A year later, I sent them a photograph of the house in the snow and I said, wouldn't it be great to turn this into a residency? And then they replied, you need to do this. It was something that the farmer and his wife had talked about. So it pulled on a lot of different backgrounds, you know, working in arts administration at various times and being very interested in landscape and then having a sort of desire to try and turn it into something. So I showed up the following summer and we put a team together. The whole top floor is a studio and downstairs is three bedrooms and a bathroom and a kitchen and an outhouse. We were done by the end of July. And so I didn't create any structure or application process or anything, but already just through the rumor mill, people were interested. And I had started an Instagram account and it brought people so quickly. So we were able to have some artists come at the end of that summer. By November, the snow comes back and then eventually you can no longer reach the building and it's completely cut off. Mm -hmm. So we're not active in the winter. So I had all winter to kind of work up the next season. And I managed to completely fill it. We had six residencies with two or three people in each of them. We ran from April to October last year. I went twice. I was there in the spring. And then I went again in September. It's been this tremendous project. It's been interesting for the artists who love the isolation, this overwhelming connection with the nature, being in a huge valley, looking down on the fjord that comes in, waterfalls from the mountains in the distance, snow-capped mountains around and then I've been working to sort of create connections so that they're not just entirely in isolation, but they can meet some of the locals and the locals also get to find out who are these people. And there's a museum of witchcraft and sorcery in like the nearest town. And they also have a restaurant. So we made a few sort of show and tells where the artists will come in the afternoon and talk about their work and people have meals and ask questions and so forth. And then also some of the artists express interest in doing workshops with some of the local kids. You know, so it's had a low impact, but important impact in what is a very, very underpopulated area of Iceland. So I guess my title is artistic director mm -hmm. of this. So I handle all the applications and the advertising and I post all the pictures on social media. And I created something called the Fjordcast where I interview artists who are there and then put that up on Instagram live. Of course, the, the sadness of the yeah, COVID yeah. is that I can't go <laughs> so uh, the people from the u.s are not welcome in iceland because our yeah. infection levels are so high so residencies yeah. are really about a time and place for artists to concentrate solely in their work often being in a different environment is part of it but being separate from your regular life that often involves interaction with other artists what i'm hoping to do is to create an online gallery and collect some of the work that has been inspired by the residency and it's also a way to join people together who weren't there at the same time necessarily but then can kind of meet through each other's work and so forth i guess here it would be kind of considered workshops 
my cousin, who's the photographer, actually hosts workshops for a week and people come from all over and they stay in this house. I mean, it's mainly on wedding photography, the proper way of setting up. Yeah, it's similar. Ours is like that, except no one's directing you. But some residencies, you know, they have a curriculum, almost like a sort of mini art school for a month. So I named the organization Gilles Fyodor Arts and Gilles Fyodor Arts is also its Instagram. Going back with my history of my work, I was always intrigued by big, wide open spaces that were slightly peculiar. The deserts around Los Angeles were always really intriguing to me. Being in places that were sort of molded by pretty extreme geological forces, yeah, and that was something that I felt after leaving Europe was really intriguing to me. And there was something so elemental that I loved about the deserts here, which is sort of what really drew me. My intrigue with landscape is often to try to describe the emotion of the landscape, like those some of those crazy oh, desert towns that I photographed around the Salton Sea. Can you tell us a little bit about your study of the Salton Sea? Salton Sea, which is a large inland lake just south of Palm Springs in California. It's California's largest lake in the 90s was very unknown. When I talked about the Salton Sea, nobody yeah. seemed to know where it was. I went there and I thought, okay, there's a huge body of water in the desert. Shouldn't people be here? What, like, why isn't yeah. this like a resort or something? What's the story? So it turns out that it's a natural depression. Oh. It's below sea level. And in 1905, there was a flood from the Colorado, which broke through some gates where they were trying to irrigate an area. And when it broke through, it created this giant channel and all the water from the Colorado flowed in the wrong direction into what was called the Salton Sink for a year and a half, making a 40 mile long lake. It was a huge feat of private engineering to try to block this gap to get the Colorado yeah. back on track and to stop the flood. And they eventually did it. And then this lake was born. And then in the 60s, it became popular for water skiing and recreation and so forth. And so all these little towns started to pop up and there was a little land rush. And then towards the end of the 60s, there was a series of storms and the lake would alternately flood and then it would shrink and then it would flood. And so it made it very, very difficult for development. So it sort of fell into disuse and uh, but had all these sort of intriguing ruins, old motels and so forth. Anyway, I was out there wondering about as I was tended to do and was absolutely fascinated by this strange and lonely place the place that had a kind of warning aspect to it have you been to san pedro i know you're in la i grew up in san pedro and i've just kind of been watching this small oh. fisherman town turn into this just almost beautiful waterfront a lot of the abandoned warehouses have been turned into like breweries. They've just kind of been reamping, but with the appreciation of these buildings. I feel like growing up, San Pedro was one of these little towns kind of forgotten. I think the only reason it was still remembered was because of the support of LA. Throughout the years, most recent years, I guess the millennials have come in and taken an appreciation to the buildings. So you're talking about this just, I'm like, have you been to San Pedro? You have to go. I worked at this coffee shop. It was like a little hidden coffee shop called the corner store. <laughs> that was back when I was in high school. It's kind of almost a photographer and painters kind of stop. They tend to go there because it's just kind of like a little hidden coffee shop. And she puts up all their art. I don't know the corner store and I definitely will check that out. But I do have a, a very big connection with San Pedro. Growing up in Southampton, which was mm -hmm. a huge port, I was fascinated with ships yeah. as a kid. And I got really, really interested in the history of ships, so much so that I knew about this really, really obscure company called the Los Angeles Steamship Company when I was 15 living oh, in wow. Southampton. And so I went to the Los Angeles Maritime Museum, mm -hmm. which is in San Pedro. I went down there thinking, I'm going to go down and find out about that steamship company that used to be in L.A. You know, this would be the place to find out that history. So I went there and I spent a day looking through their stuff and I didn't really see anything. I talked to the librarian, who was English, actually, and he said, actually, nobody has ever written a book about the Los Angeles steamship oh. company. It was like somebody took the oh. lid off the roof and the light poured in. I thought, it's oh. your job. You have to do this. It was a bit like the stilts. <laughs> so I spent years researching the history of this steamship company. Thank goodness I met somebody else who was an English major and also had heard of this obscure company. We became co-authors. His name is Gordon Garib. And we wrote a book entitled Hollywood to Honolulu, the Los Angeles Steamship oh. History. It was part of the boosterism of the 20s. Los Angeles wanted to compete with San Francisco, which was a very busy port and had a lot of international connections. L.A. was a quiet yeah. place. This lumber 
a bit of fishing. So they basically created this dream of like sailing off to Hawaii. And so they had two routes. One went to Hawaii, one went to San Francisco because it was faster than the train oh, to wow. San Francisco in that era. So I had an exhibition about that at the Maritime Museum some years ago. And then the Maritime Museum invited me to make a proposal for a wall piece. They made a, a children's area of the museum and they wanted to have something bright and colorful. And so I stood on the roof of the Maritime Museum and I took photos of the view, details of the view. And then I tiled together these photographs so that you had all this activity, container ships coming and going, fishing coming and going. You had, I collaged it into this giant image and they had it screened onto like signboard material. So it was like a massive photograph that would last forever. And that's oh. still up. So uh, I love St. Peter. Well, it's interesting yeah. to hear these connections, like you're interested in maritime and then you end up in Los Angeles and discover San Pedro and then the Queen Mary and other points of interest in California. Do you have any other creative outlets? I do actually have a little bit of a hankering to paint uh -huh. and draw, but I feel like I've attended it so little that it's not something I would ever want to present as my career work or something yeah. I would have a show but I do enjoy sort of painting in private <laughs> and then my husband and I like to make marmalade out of the fruit that grows on the trees in our garden and I was telling Eric just before this started my mum and dad used to always make mm -hmm. all kinds of things I think left over from sort of wartime austerity where you would bottle and make gooseberry jam and you know so forth it was very natural to them and when my then husband-to-be came over and visited my father showed us how to oh. make marmalade and so marmalade traditionally uses seville oranges which mm -hmm. are not easy to get in california so i thought well we could probably make it from grapefruit because uh, that grows in abundance we got yeah. a huge grapefruit tree so we adapted the recipe and then eventually i felt like I really wanted to go traditional. So I actually bought a young Seville tree and we grew it. And now we're making normally <laughs> from that tree. <laughs> so. so speaking of your husband, are you drawn more to introverts or extroverts? I would say he's more introverted okay. than I am. But I think originally one of the many reasons I ended up in the States was because I was attracted to extroverts. And I thought the <laughs> nation seemed like an extrovert nation. After growing up with, you know, a certain amount of reserve in English people, I found this refreshing enthusiasm. One of the things that drew me here was how extrovert people are. However, being in a relationship with somebody, <laughs> <laughs> um, taking that description that I'd read about, you know, introverts recharging in quiet, he really, really enjoys his own company, does not need to be the center of attention. And so I would say probably more on the introvert scale. And yet, when there's something to be said, He's out there saying it. And now I would have been a mess and researching <laughs> and coming up with notes and background yeah. and so forth. So, yeah, we're quite different. And I think we enjoy each other's speech. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> we should be taking notes, huh? So, um, can I ask, do you enjoy travel? Last year I was in Iceland twice and I was in England. So, I think three months of the year I was traveling. Uh, yes, I love to travel. And I don't really seem to want to go anywhere <laughs> else now except Iceland and England. You know, because there's work to yeah. do, there's things to be done, you know. I mean, I'm curious about other places, but I've got these passion projects and I just <laughs> really want to continue them. And I can't yeah. travel limitlessly, so I sort of had to make decisions. But in the past, I'd traveled quite exotically with another friend of mine over our ship interest. We were determined to find the sort of remains of the old passenger liner fleet wherever they were. And that meant sometimes they were still sailing and we would go on cruises in deliberately ancient cruise ships that were sort of being reused in some lesser capacity off Canada or somewhere like that. But we also went to, you know, the Philippines, and Hong Kong, mainland China, Bermuda, just to find ships in layup and photograph them and explore them. And then the logical extension with that was to go to India where they get scrapped mm. on the beach. Mm. Travel has been very important to me. And I think I was influenced a lot by my sister who traveled a great deal. I would see <laughs> her going off to extraordinary places and yeah. doing extraordinary things. Now, you mentioned India and scraps and ships. What exactly is that? Uh, it's a controversial activity where it happens in India because the people who are scrapping the ships are not necessarily with protective equipment. Um, it's being done with hand tools. They're just on a beach. They're just, you know, so this enormous liner is just rammed up onto the beach and then it's taken apart with hammers of 
people with cutting tools and bare feet. And there's a great deal of dangerous chemistry inside ships. You know, they're filled with cadmium and lead and PCBs and all sorts of asbestos. It's a pretty gruesome thing. And because it's such an expensive proposition, it's sort of been outsourced to third world countries, which is being very uh, scrutinized by the West. Like, what responsibility do we have having run this ship and then given it to people who are going to possibly be injured in its yeah. demolition? And the raw material is the steel, which can be repurposed as rebar. Uh, and then all of the fittings, everything that goes into it, finds another market wow. somewhere. So in fact, my bedroom door is the door from a 1950s mm. British ocean liner that used to be in the restaurant. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> so, and, and going back to the artist's way, I was just going to say, there was a book that I never managed to finish because I would get so enthusiastic about some project and then I would just be off and running with the project. But it was always something that, you know, in a more fallow time, I would then come back to and sort of start over again, like reimagine yeah. your creativity through those exercises mm -hmm. and through the writing and so forth. But I would never get to the end of the book because every time I would just be like, <laughs> off I go into another, <laughs> into another project. So. Yeah, I'm only a few pages in, and, and yeah, I put it down because I'm like, I have an idea. I wanted to bring up one last exhibit that actually stood out to me on an emotional level was uh, Dawn on Sunset, because coming from Los Angeles and living there for a long time, those photos, oh, they're just so striking. It was actually inspired by being in Iceland. And the connection is that because in the northern latitudes, the sun sets at a very slow angle, the period after the sun sets and when it actually gets dark is very long. It can be almost two hours of deepening blue. And in Los Angeles, it's completely the opposite. It's like you could be reading a book in full sunlight and you look up yeah. mm -hmm. and the sun has set. And I mean, it's so fast here, the transition from day to night, because we're nearer the equator. So the sun drops more straight down. Yeah. So I felt like I'd become hyper aware of that liminal mm -hmm. space between day and night that in Iceland goes on for so long and is so magical that I wanted to kind of Mm -hmm. explore it here being close to sunset boulevard and the name sunset and the idea of dawn and sunset um but also i like to photograph as you can see from all the other work there's almost <laughs> no people in the shots and i was sort of intrigued to find a period of time when sunset boulevard was also <laughs> without people <laughs> because it's very rare mm -hmm. it's, it's like this brief moment before the roar of the city comes now is it interested in catching kind of an unfamiliar moment in a place that's yeah. very familiar well, this has been great. Yeah, thank you for coming on and sharing with us the way... The way you see things, especially in Iceland. It's a place you never thought, I don't know, it would be very yeah. photogenic. I, mean, I never knew I'd end yes. up there. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, and we'll definitely be sharing your links on okay. our social media, or you can quickly share with us here, too. Yeah, so Instagram would be at Martin Cox Photos, and my website is martincox.com, and then the... Iceland project is Gils Fjordor Arts, but you might need to read that on the website. <laughs> it's a little tricky. <laughs> yes. right, perfect. Thank you. And it was so nice meeting you, Martin. Good luck with everything. Thank you for okay. including me. Thank you for spending time with us. If you have questions or a story you'd like to share, email us at wallflowersinbloom2020 at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at wallflowers underscore in underscore bloom and search for us on Facebook under Wallflowers in Bloom. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and CastBox. Until next time, 